Show your T-Ball team spirit and buy your hard-working Art Lab team a cup of coffee, which helps fuel purchases of high-octane equipment and T-Ball tech that get poured back into percolating, highly caffeinated content for you. Just go to buymeacoffee.com and search Therapy Bites. On this episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab. Hey, T-Ballers, are you still trying to find yourself out there? I know, I see you, you are. Do you sometimes wonder how to discover who you really are from the inside out or how people see you from the outside in, how to be yourself, stay true to yourself? Has it ever occurred to you that as an individual, you can and do have a brand just like a major corporation? Well, we have an expert in the art lab today to help you discover, hone, and leverage your personal brand and enjoy a better life of learning to be just you. But warning, beware of proceeding if you're allergic to challenging thoughts. We have an episode full of those. Our Emmy Award winning guest today is Vinny Potestivo, who enjoys talking about how he finds the best in people and to help them translate that into media that gets results. He shares ways of getting discovered and being more discoverable. He loves helping executives and founders create brands that are highly revered and respected with use of media. And he shares how to build traditional and non-traditional celebrity brands. Imagine that. In your own world, you can be a celebrity in your personal orbit by being faithful to the brand that you discovered and sculpted. Uh, Vinny has hundreds of of television shows and celebrity experiences that helps position him for helping you to find your brand and fine tune the best parts of you. T-Ballers, buckle in for some success tips and surprising quips from our very own branding boss, Vinny Potestivo, in an episode we call Discovering and Living Your Personal Brand, The Everyday Psychology of Self, coming up next in Therapy Bites Art Lab. Stay tuned following the interview for On the Couch and Off the Rocker, our special guest's psychosilly analysis by Art Lab's own head cabager, Dr. Ima Freudnot. Welcome to Therapy Bites Art Lab, where Dr. Heath and his special guests share real-life stories of helping and healing. Fresh from the actual therapy couch, while taking a bite out of common counseling missteps and misconceptions. And now, here's he and the T-Ball team. Hey, T-Ballers, welcome to another episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab, where we explore the real-life psychology of everyday life. And today we have uh, Vinny Potestivo. And Vinny told me earlier, I got that right the very first time. I was telling him I really love names. And when I first saw he was going to come on the show, I went through all the different iterations of the various ways I could say his name. And because I, I just like having fun with stuff like that, I've got a weird brain. And Vinny was telling me that even his family pronounces his name differently sometimes. Yeah, no, they do, by the way. Uh, I think there's a real relationship between audio and information. So I too will say things, re say them, and in, in, in sort of. Uh, pl- I want to say play around with them a little bit in my head sometimes to make them my own. But this is how I get really good at remembering and connecting names with faces. And over my sort of like 25 year career in, in casting and, and talent development and, and, and helping business owners be successful in media, um, I've gotten to cast Housewives and I got to work with the Osbournes on the Osbournes and Ashton Kutcher on Punked. Um, those are some names that might be easier to remember because we see their face and their names so much. You know, um, and for us who are maybe business owners, um, solopreneurs, creators who are are using our creativity to communicate, not just to entertain, but to communicate our values, our services, um, our, the benefits that we bring to society. I get excited about that piece. Um, and uh, yeah, there's this like real sonic relationship to names. And I love that you said my name prior to even being here that's really cool by the way oh thank you you know i I was hoping i would nail it the first time and because i've been called everything in the book it's so weird Uh, i go by heath heath is my middle name and i uh my uh my parents uh met in a convenience store and my dad was looking for 
a, a, a payday bar and my mom was looking for a Snickers and it'd be weird to name a kid Snickers or Payday, so they name me Heath. And I made all that up. I just, I just, I just love doing that to people. No, it's it's from the Big Valley. My name is from the Big Valley. Uh, a all guy right. played by Lee Majors played Heath Barkley in the Big Valley, an old TV western. And my dad loved that show, and he named me Heath from uh, the Big Valley. But so many people get that wrong. I've been called Steve and Heth and Health. I mean, who names their kid <laughs> Health? Yeah, my parents name me Health. I get mail addressed to Health Meeks. That's so funny. I was just reading on the internet how Yellowstone actually has had an impact in child names and that some of the names of the main characters of Yellowstone are now showing up as oh, trends abs- yeah, especially yeah. in certain areas in america so yeah you, you can sense. go online and there's a you can do a google search i don't know the name of this but there's actually uh name frequency charts by decade uh in the u.s and the world and you can look yeah. back during my date of birth back in the mid 60s where there's a spike in people being named heath and i had a patient the other day who decided to name their daughter Hazel, and I said, "Holy moly, Hazel! That's a name from the early 1900s. When's the last time you heard of a kid named Hazel? I love that. It's a color, but that's just great." And yeah, I'm my mom big, had a great grandma Hazel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a, I'm a big names guy. You know, there's the old joke, and it, it's supposed to be true, where um, the famous Hog family out of Texas. And, and this may be politically incorrect. I don't mean for it to be. It's just a story. But the Hogg family out of Texas named one daughter Ima and one daughter Yura. And then there's the uh, old thing about uh, the inventor of the Learjet, uh, supposedly named his daughter Shanda. Oh, sh- <laughs> <laughs> it's Shanda. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we could talk about names all day. But, folks, we're here today to talk about Vinny's area of expertise, which is discovering and living your personal brand, the everyday psychology of self. In the art lab, we find many, many people just trying to find out who they are, but then they, they seem to decide who they are, but then they don't stay faithful to it. And I'm going to guess that in your business, that's a big problem with branding of celebrities and companies is they're trying to figure out who they are. And then in yeah. this uh, rigmarole social media, wild, wild west show that we seem to live in, st- staying faithful to who you are no matter what. Yeah, I, I sort of would say it this way. Um, don't let your skill set take you to places where your character shouldn't be. Right, we're all capable of doing quite a lot. I and and I can even talk about it this way. I think that we get confused in our brand. I think we get confused. I think um, that uh, what's it called uh, uh, when you don't believe you're good enough to do something? Uh, it's not a minimizing voice. Well, uh, people pers- call uh, it all kinds of things. Uh, you know, lack of self confidence, <laughs> imposter syndrome yeah. is a big one. Imposter syndrome. That's a yeah. That's a trigger word. I think imposter syndrome, lack of self confidence, uh, confusion in the brand. I think that that comes in in a certain, a very specific space in brand creation. And I, I think there's a space of um, what we are doing and what we can be doing, and and what we can be doing. And what we are doing, when this space increases too much, I find that's where the devil comes in. I find that's that's when when other people's opinions start to really matter that we don't even know. Other people's actions matter that we don't even know. Like we start mimicking, you know, um, uh, moves based on what we think is going to bring us success. And I've seen this happen time and time again. And I say it like a uh, genie in the bottle. Be careful what you wish for. You know, if you're wishing for something, if you're asking for someone else to make something happen for you, be careful about giving someone else control over your own destiny. We have ownership over when and how we're visible, over where and and with whom we we're shared, how we spend our time. We can literally pick and choose where we want to be discovered and stay there until we are. And I love helping people figure that out. I think 25 years ago when I got into the TV. You needed a casting director like me to tap you on the shoulder at some in sync concert and say, Hey, you got a great look. Come to MTV and I'll audition you to be a host and maybe put you in some films. And because that, that was how we were meeting people. Also, I want to point out that that was my specific job at MTV. 
um, I wasn't a producer. I wasn't an executive yet. I literally was hired by MTV to meet people, which is awesome because I didn't know a single person in the industry. I'm gonna I'm gonna share all of this. Like I don't want to get lost in the glitz and glam of the names that I can rattle off that we all know that are household names. Well, yeah, are, but you 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 run into some I mean, very famous people, and and before the, the now. shows <laughs> before the show's over today, what I'd like to also get into is. Is and, and and I don't mean for this to be a rhetorical question. I'd really like to dig into it at some point. Is do you not find also? I would suspect that you find also that some of the biggest names out there, uh, Ashton Kutcher, you named, and who else did I have written down here? Mandy Moore, uh, Beyonce. That no matter how famous these people are, they still struggle with branding. Yeah. They still struggle with who they are and who they're going to be. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, this is a great theme and I'll get to the answer. (laughs) I love how you're setting this up. We'll get to the answer by the end of this episode, but you're right. Um, There's a reason why Beyonce, why we all know right now that Beyonce has, uh, is one of the most decorated nominated um, uh, award, Grammy awards as an artist. There's a reason why we know that she has, I think it's nine current Grammy nominations that are current right now for this, for this last up for this last, um, album. There's a reason why we know that there's a reason why she put herself up for those awards. There's a reason why she's going to leverage those awards. Awards are something that we have in common. I started in high school, best dressed, class president, you know, we start having social construct awards because those are things that we can do peer to peer in our companies and our businesses. We might have won, you know, by the way, I'm even thinking in school, not only did the students get awards, the parents get awards. My son is a high school scene, you know, oh, my course. son is in the honor roll, right? So like these are awards that feed the ego. And when you feed that ego and, and here's, and I want to bring this up and, sh- and, and really, and especially with you here, and, and I, I'm going to bring this up because it's a sensitive conversation, but I'll go here because I've got you to help me handle this ego, which is a beast Yeah, and, and it's inevitable and it's curbable and it's controllable. And if your ego is asking me to feed it, well then I'll tell you, be careful what I give your ego because I'm going to give your ego what I think is best, to be honest, for me. What's best for me happens to truly, truly, and I'm a steward of people. Like what, what's truly best for me is what's best for you. This is, <laughs> this is a deep coping mechanism that I created <laughs> as a six-year-old that I turned into a superpower. Oh, that's I've, awesome. I've used my entire life, by the way, right? Putting people in front of me and, and being a people pleaser and, and all of that comes from some dark areas that that my siblings got me through my peers the people younger than me got me through not this not the adults in my life who were supposed to get me there and i realized how much control i have over my own destiny over my own story so much so that i love that we talked about our names so much when i went to college i changed my name from vinny with a y to vinny with an ie uh, i stepped into my sexuality in 1995 i had to make a decision on if I was going to talk about my sexuality with my family or if I was even going to be able to to have a long-term relationship back then because some of the rights I have now, to be brutally honest, were not even fathomable to me in the early 90s, um, which made me turn to technology, to be honest. And I started meeting people on websites and blogs and I started using the internet to meet people and I still do it. That's the craziest part. I do the same exact thing I did 25 years ago. When I was in college, I felt called, truly I felt called to put an ad out on something called Backstage, which is where you go to look for non-union actors. And I said, I am looking to film my files. If you want future work and I'm looking for future work, send me your headshots and if I get it, I'll send you some information. One Campus Road, Student Box 577. You know, I didn't even create my company. I had no idea that this was, you know, how things were going to you know, rock how, my how world. How old were you at that point, Vinny? 19. I was 19. Holy moly, you were 19. Yeah, 19. Wow. Yeah, 19, just turning 20. Uh, I, re- I didn't know that because now, my, now I have a, I my have handle a, had my age in it. <laughs> Vinny and I didn't talk about every question I would ask, and so all this is is – well, this is recorded, but it's live. Yeah, we're we're coming up with this stuff on the fly, and I don't mean this to be a trick question, but I'm going to guess that you had a great amount of fear. The 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 things you just talked about mm-hmm. did not come absent 
of the presence of fear. Absolutely. And the thing I want to point out to our listeners and our viewers on our YouTube channel is when you're making decisions uh, because you don't have fear or because you do have fear, that's called emotional reasoning. Uh, What Vinny was doing, whether he knew he was doing it or not, was he was deciding that fear was not evidence that I should not do this. He had fear, and he did it anyway. And I think that's spectacular. <laughs> you sum me up. You just gave me goosebumps. I have to make sure my mom listens to this one, by the way. <laughs> you I sum mean, me up. F- 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 fear is much. wonderful. F- fear can tell us sure. all kinds of things. I tell the story Absolutely. that you know, f- uh, fear kept me from being run over by a city bus in New York one time. I, I literally went to step off of a curb and I saw something in my left peripheral vision. Uh, whatever my brain decided that was created fear, I immediately jumped back and phew, there comes the city yeah. bus. So, yes, uh, what we do with fear uh, depends on how we decide to interpret it. And what Vinny didn't do, once again, is he didn't interpret the presence of fear is meaning he should not step out and do everything he did to accomplish where he is. Oh yeah, I love that. By the way, please keep doing this. This is this is you'll keep me here for hours if this is <laughs> if this is how it will go because I have so much to go I have so much to go through with you. <laughs> um, as you say that, I have to say I think the reason why I did that, um, and I'll share this as a when I was in fifth grade uh, at a a, a parent. Um, almost overdose, and I was I was the kid who came home and 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 saw, found the situation. And you know, when you believe that parents have all the answers, and you believe that, and there was no internet back then too, so I have to point that out. There was no no other other than walking a couple of miles to the library or asking my <laughs> my you know teacher or my um my youth group leader you know information other parents right. That's how the system that I was built into. And created in was parents were going to give us all the answers and then they were going to live with us at the end of life. <laughs> yeah. That's the system that I was built. Um, I think it's, it's, we've reconstructed it since then. I think that getting through that moment, making the phone call that I had to make asking for help at a point in time where I'm the oldest of four growing up. I'm now the oldest of six. My dad um, remarried, but I'm growing up. I'm the oldest of four. There's no internet. So my ego creates answers because no one's around to give us answers. So, so the ego in me says, well, I don't want to say, I don't know, because that doesn't seem fair to my brothers and sisters. I started, so I just made stuff up that really sound, I, and I meant it from the best part of my heart, but we uh-huh. still laugh about it that we, you thought, you know, Nikki thought my, <laughs> my sister <laughs> thought that New York city pigeons were dildo, like were dildo, were, were dodo birds. Oh my God. Dodo birds. That, oh my word. You told her word. that it was dodo birds. She told me that it was dodo birds. Oh, by the way. okay. Um, and, and I, sorry, sorry for that <laughs> slip up on the word. Actually, the reason why I said that word is because this conversation happened at an episode of Tom Green show. So I'm 21. I bring uh-huh. my six, 15, 16 year old sister to MTV because she wants me to get this job. So I'm so happy to be at a place where, you know, her friends think I'm cool. My cousins think I'm cool. You know, meanwhile, my brother Joey, a year younger than me, he's in the Air Force. My aunts and uncles think, you know, they're giving. So we went, we went, we went, we went on our own unique ways. Um, but yeah, information was scarce back then, and uh, a lot of it was a creative. A lot of it, I think, I turned to my creativity to get me out of it. And I almost went to school for psychology, and I thought to myself, as a lifelong student who's sat in the seat and received information from psychologists and have been in group situations in Al-Anon and Alateen since I was a kid, I felt compelled to not go into psychology because I know how important that information is and how it can truly change someone's life. <laughs> do, do, you, do you think that you first but thought then, about going into psychology to kind of figure things out? Um, figure people out. Figure people out. Yourself being yeah, one I, of those? Uh, I was okay if I have, I was, pro- my mind's really answering this, honestly. I, I would be okay if I landed on something, I know that I'm going to find or propel to find the answer for someone else. I'm going to be, I'm going to, sh- you know, that, at that stage of the game, I show up for people way before I show up. It's easier to sit in the audience. This is that one skill set that I picked up as a podcaster. As a 45 year old that I didn't have in my 20s, 
is is being able to bear the sound of my voice and, and the visibility of me, by the way, uh, during my 20 year career in TV, this is what I did. I interview people. This is exactly what I did. And then I oh, cut my wow. voice completely out. No, no face, no voice. I just edit down a reel where it's your sound bites, your story. And I send that to the network and then they make you a housewife or a show host or, you know, so I, I, I professionally learned to remove my voice and my presence from the room. Um, without making myself small, that was that was my trick. That was the. Some people wanted me to be a little bit smaller. I'm six foot three. Like I'm, I've got are you really? Wow, pounds. I can't, like I can't got, tell on a, camera. <laughs> you you look like you're about room. three inches tall on camera, but I do too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It's fun coming out out of this pandemic, meeting people in real life finally, and uh, and filling the room with our energy and our physical presence um, but but i want to go back to your voice did, did yeah. you have to get used to the sound of your voice like most people you want to know um something really funny uh, a thousand percent that i have to get used to my voice a thousand percent uh i wouldn't even say getting used to my voice i would i think i learned this from andy moore um i i learned the power in my voice it wasn't I didn't want to just accept my voice. I, I didn't want that to be my goal and I didn't want to get used to it. You know, when we get used to things, we become numb. We tune out certain pieces of it. We're not addressing the actual friction that we're hearing. We're just accepting it. And um, I worked really hard for the last three or four years trying to figure out how to get away from the public world of media where I have deliverables that are predicated on how many episodes we can create because that's how production companies and networks make money versus how can I truly help the people that I'm looking to elevate, whose, whose careers I'm looking to elevate on TV. And I realized that, that you know, to get to television, you have to go through a lot of an approval processes and, and uh, it's a really high reach and you need a pretty – high platform to be honest to reach those goals and you build that platform slowly and in casting what i was doing was helping people build that platform so they could reach becoming a a veteran housewife on bravo or uh, a show host on mtv for 30 or 40 seasons or or the executive producer of a franchise or a global franchise i love helping people reach these goals because i think there's power in our stories and in owning our content so i help people create that platform Piece by piece, brick by brick, stone by stone, twig by twig, <laughs> air by air. Sometimes, sometimes it's grace. When I say air, I'm like, it starts with grace, by the way. It's Absolutely, you, flatten, yeah. you flatten the space out. I'm like, I'm looking at my desk. I'm like, everything off, as big amount of grace as I can get, and then slowly, slowly start chipping away and learning. And, um, and that was powerful for me to get there. It was hard. There's a lot of things in my head that we, you know, I'm, I'm sure anyone can relate to this. My first off, I haven't. I'm from Staten Island. I feel like I have an accent. I feel like I talk a certain <laughs> way that, you know, and all these things that held me back. And here I am. And I hope you're watching us on YouTube because the amount of hand action <laughs> that it, if anything, I'm so sorry about. Yes, how yes. Modern half hands half of what Vinny has to say, he does with his hands. <laughs> and I think that's great. But if you're just listening, you're missing that part. But we're glad you're listening. But he's doing that with his hands. <laughs> but it, it's so traffic. strange for you to say that you think you have an accent because uh, I'll just give you some feedback. Uh, you have a wonderfully rich and deep voice. Uh, your enunciation is perfect. And those of you listening, I'm sure it's not lost on you that Doc Keith here, I, I'm often told I have an accent, but I can't hear it. And I had a I had a voice teacher, and I love him. Uh, I really, really do love him. He actually told me that I needed to develop more of a Ted Koppel voice. He said, mm -hmm. if you're going to be out there speaking, you need to develop a neutral accent. And I thought about that for many, many years. And I was having dinner with one of the most wonderful ladies on the planet, who's now passed away. And her name was Coney. But it was spelled C O N Y E, C O N Y E. And I told Coney this story, and she said, Your accent is part of who you are. Mm -hmm. Your accent is part of your identity. Instead of trying to get rid of it, learn to embrace it. And I think that that's one of the biggest things I see uh, our own patients struggle with, and what we call the art lab, which, by the way, 
a few new listeners, stands for Accurate Realistic Thinking Life Affirming Beliefs, the Art Lab, is mm. is really getting down to finding value in all the aspects of yourself because you don't have to go out there and find those somewhere else. They're already there within you. And folks like Vinny, uh, I would guess with celebrities, it isn't a point of helping them find their voice or find their character or find their talent out there somewhere. He's simply an expert in uncovering what already exists. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you have this art lab, by the way. You know what I teach people? I teach people the art of collaboration and accumulation, especially now. That that I love this feedback that you got, by the way. And which what there was a sh- when I got to MTV in the late '90s, there was a shift in journalism. I I, I I'm going to repeat a story that I was told from a journalist who said to me that when she was high, she, she's Korean American, she thought forever her job would be sort of like what you saw Connie Chung do successfully in mass media. So she assumed that's what her career would forever look like. And she still stepped up to the plate and did it. And when she came into audition for MTV, I was lucky enough to be the person who auditioned her for MTV News. So that's when you meet someone at a at the moment where two planets collide, this is like a forever connection <laughs> that I will have, you know? And she said that she came into the network and she came into the audition and she realized by the time she had left how important who she was to the story. That up until the point in media, journalists were stripped from their accents. There's a, a mid-American, a neutral American, a media American um, dialect by a way, um, that uh, unconsciously uh, ABC, NBC, and some of the major TV owners in our space came together and agreed on. Um, The accent is important because that is nationally how we're represented in the world. It's weird to say this, but like when you go to Greece or Italy, where they have so many different dialects, but there's one movie that comes out in Italian, you don't get you know, all five or, or 50 different dialects yeah. and accents. There's one, and, and that country literally has a film commission designed to engineer what an Italian should sound like when, it's, when he's or she or they are talking you know, on, based on a predicator on an American This, this, this is the so, end-all, be-all, agreed-upon Italian voice. Yeah, and what, I, what, I, what like irks me and irates me and actually gets me excited about is like – that was a weird strategy because we own our content now and the content we own needs to sound like us and it needs to feel like us. The editing should be completely different than anything you're seeing on television. It should be however you want it. By the way, it should be rough. It should be tough. It should be how you want to be remembered, not how your advertiser is dictating artwork or tone or topic, which is what happens in the public sector of media. And I'm, 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 I'm on this side of media now, helping business owners, helping independent brand owners, talent brand. If we identify as a creator, a creative, or someone who uses communication creatively, how to own your content so you can better leverage it. When you own your content, for example, and you're writing, and you're writing a bl- one blog post per episode of your podcast, what you now can do on Google is take your podcast RSS and your blog, or actually your, your, your podcast's blog RSS, and upload that to Google News Verification so that your RSS feed is accessible and approved through the conditions of Google. And what that does is it allows people to find you as a source and not mm-hmm. as a story. And when they can tap into you as a source, that level of trust, and this is where being a source over story matters most. Is that if I'm sitting here trying to pitch my product, my story, all these all these transactional pieces without you truly trusting the source that it's coming from, then then I'm spinning my wheels. You now, know, now, I mean, no matter how, how, how would you yeah. differentiate between source and story? So the the idea of this here, so story is transactional. Story is now of the moment. Story is this happened to me. I won an award. This, I, I had this quote. I, uh, this person said something to me on a podcast. And what I'm able to do is actually take all of those things that I just said, all of those stories, opportunity. And because I'm a source, because I have a, I made a connection with a network, 
over 20 years at the New York at, at, a, at a leading New York magazine and, and newspaper where I'm able to pitch them. They know that I'm a trusted source. They know that I'm I'm in the industry. They know that if I tell them I have a lead and they tell their boss that that lead exists, that I'll come through with the information. And sometimes here's the lead. The lead for me, when I just started to record my podcast, I turned to my friends from MTV because I was terrified. So I thought, you know, if I don't want people to hear me ask questions, then I, then I got to give them someone they're going to want to listen to the answers on. So I sat down with Mandy Moore and we talked about just the creative process and, and, and st- we talked about stacking. We talked about accumulation. We talked about she has a production company. She's the lead actress. She's getting nominated. Basically, emotionally committed to directing an episode and she was going to go off and have the conversation with the EPs. And we were able to leverage that relationship with the New York Post that was then picked up by hundreds of blogs um, just from that soundbite, which led back to my podcast with uh, a clip from her saying it in text. Um, not only did it live on the newspaper in, in, in NewYorkPost.com, but also in the Sunday paper, which was pretty cool because it was a Mandy Moore and This Is Us was is a very relevant show. Um, lots of people will be lucky enough to get to interview Mandy Moore. Lots of oh, people will yeah. be lucky enough to interview you know dozens and hundreds of celebrities, and and we'll be in that category soon too. But not everyone will have the trust of a platform to be able to take that story and run with it. And that's where being a source more so than the story. I want to translate it one other way, non-creative. Here's how I was the source and not the story at MTV. I, 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 as a casting exec, didn't go around looking for who I needed to hire. That's, That's being the story. I was the source. I went around and said, I'm working on these shows. If you know anyone who might be right for it, let me know. And I had these conversations with maybe 50 to 100 mavericks and, and, and key influencers, not in, this, not in this, the term of uh, social media, but influencers being uh, door people and uh, reception and nightlife and um, just connectors in the community. Because I knew that a lot of the shows I was about to work on on MTV, first off, were out of my... I didn't have cultural reference. I was outside of the community. I didn't fully have grasp of the language. So I'm not going to get it wrong. But I knew that if I collaborated and I worked with people that I would. And and it's it's tricky because I'm hiring talent. So that talent gets hired. So I have this person who introduced me. And often, and and I never, to be honest, I never paid anyone um, a stipend for successfully helping me connect them to something. Instead, I kept the door open long enough. I gave them enough tools and resources from within MTV to be successful. And, and they are all some of my closest friends, but executive also executive producers of TV shows and have deep relationships now with MTV because I kept that door open. I wow. and, and because, as you say, you're a source. Yeah, that's why. And, and I want to put some shoe leather on this for our listeners because, uh, of course, you know, my area is psychology and neuroscience and psychotherapy and all that. But what, what I'm hearing Vinny say that you guys can apply to your life and your relationships with your children, with your spouses, with your significant others, with your siblings. If you're from a large family like uh, Vinny and mine, Vinny's family is larger than mine. There are only four of us uh, with an employer is everybody has a story and your story is important. Never forget about that. Your story is important. And I think every human story is important. And maybe we'll have time to get into that. But as a source, uh, you as a parent uh, are, can be the source of something that your kid can't get anywhere but you. As a spouse, as a significant other, you can be a source of something, some information, some guidance, some support that, that those who rely on you can't get anywhere else. And here's a little tip for you from Doc Keith, and that is if you are like every other parent out there, let's just take a sample of a thousand parents. If you are like uh, uh, the other 999 parents out there, then 999 of you are redundant and unnecessary. If you are like, uh, and I don't want to pick on any certain celebrity, but since she's been in the news, Britney Spears, mm-hmm. if, if there's a thousand people like Britney Spears, then 999 of those 
are redundant and unnecessary. For full show notes and transcript of today's episode, go to therapybytes.podbean.com. Welcome to Social Media Smackdown. Tonight, the irresistible force meets the illogical object. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to Hey, T-Ball, it's Doc Heath here, and we're here on Social Media Smackdown to give a shout-out to a fellow warrior on Social Media Smackdown, Bull 19, Bull 91, Bull 21, who responded to a comment with this. People don't want to take responsibility for their well-being. It's easier to say, I was gaslighted, hence I'm a victim. Victims will be gaslighted because they are prone to be victims. Once they change their pattern of thinking and communicating, there will be no one to gaslight, but it's easier to blame the other. You know Bull 19, Bull 91, Bull 21? I couldn't have said it better myself. Here's a shout-out from Doc Keith on taking down some pseudo-psychological social media Kool-Aid and Ricky nonsense. Catch you next time, guys. Doc Keith out. What a slobber knocker. The winner by Psychological Smackdown, Doc Heath. No pronouns were harmed during the production of this podcast. You're listening to Therapy Bites Art Lab. Bite-sized therapy for your brain with Dr. Heath and the T-Ball Team. The best advice on the net. No copay required. Welcome to the Therapy Bites Art Lab Library, where we have poured over thousands of volumes to bring you the latest Couch Crumbs quote. Oh, would you like a napkin? You're getting crumbs in the book. That okay, me eat book. Oh. Oh, nom, 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 nom. And now today's Couch Crumbs quote. Oh, hello. Glad you could join me today. You know, the more you examine your thoughts, the less the distorted ones sabotage your life. A quote by Doc Hugh. Oh, you got crumbs on the couch. Extra points for you. Live the art life. Become a T-Ball teammate, inner circle supporter on Patreon at patreon.com slash therapy bites. Here's Heath and the T-Ball team. And if you look at the universe, the universe, the thing that strikes them about the universe is it is a playground of infinite variation. It's a playground of infinite variation. Therefore, uh, not only... Uh, would it be a really bad idea for everybody to be like Doc Heath? Uh, it's not even meant to be that way. I mean, I, I think if you want to create hell on earth, create 8 billion people just like me. I mean, that would be terrible. And lots of folks would disagree. And as wonderful as Vinny is, it would be terrible to have a whole planet where everybody is Vinny Potestivo, as wonderful as Vinny is. Um, you are meant to be an individual and be unique, and that that takes uh, leaning into and finding value in your brand as a human being on this planet. And people that are thinking about all sorts of t- terrible things, I'm worthless and I'm useless and, and you know, suicide, we've got a uh, some videos coming out on YouTube on suicide. We try to pick that apart psychologically. It's not what you, th- what you think. People think that uh, uh, guns and knives and, and drugs kill people. Guns, knives, and drugs don't kill people. Distorted thinking kills people. Your distorted thinking about yourself can be deadly to you. And what we're talking about today with Vinny is the value in in your personal brand, and I hope what's coming through is the same thing that he does with celebrities to develop their personal brand you can use in your own life to find value in your talents and what you bring to the universe and what you bring to the world, what you bring to this planet, your little space on the earth is valuable also, and you need to develop that. You're here for a purpose. You're here for a reason. 
I love how you, you said, uh, as you're talking about finding value, it made me realize, uh, if you're finding it hard to create content or share information or don't even know where to start because you don't know what people find valuable, a great place to start is in yourself. What do you find most valuable? I, I, I think that I didn't realize I was asking that question, but when I was 19, I think there was a moment in my life where I said, what makes me valuable? I, I'm good at spreadsheets. I know information. I know things most people don't know because I'm, I'm curious and I have access to technology and data and the internet at a time where most people didn't have access to the internet. I worked at the computer center at school. Um, I spent thousands of hours in that center working and also helping other people communicate. And I didn't even realize this until I started talking and trying to put things into context. Those thousands of hours of helping people figure out from different majors, scientists and nurses and uh, lawyers and accountants. And like, I, I have a business degree in theater management. I, my goal was to, to be sort of be a Broadway producer and I wanted to be surrounded by talent my entire life. Um, so I took the skill set that I had and I went to the one place where I knew you could look for talent and I put out an ad. I do, I think about how, how, and I sometimes say, I don't know what made me think of creating. I really felt like I put the ad out and asked for people before I realized how I was going to receive that information. But oh, I had wow. no, no way would I have ever imagined seven, six to 700 submissions coming into school. I got in trouble. I got, you Holy know, moly, six or 700. Yeah. Hundred paying at that point in New York, it was like uh, three dollars fifty, four dollars per eight by ten that was sent to me. That's what went through my mind. Seven hundred times four dollars. I'm like, I just like people. Just <laughs> I just thousands of dollars were just spent to get this information to me. And um, if it wasn't for, and again, I didn't know anyone, and they didn't know me. We had we met over a shared goal. I put a shared goal out there. I said, I, I didn't pretend to be a casting director. I said, I'm building my files. If you're looking for new work, I'm your guy. So send me the headshots because this, is, this, is, this timing is perfect. And, and it was them who got me in the door. And I still didn't even know them. And I hate to say they knew me because they really didn't. But there was this, this connection. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it that. Maybe I'm, I'm fighting something here because I don't know who to give credit to. I'll give credit to the universe and to every person along the way who – including myself who helped me make that decision and, 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 and putting that group of people in this database, I caught the attention of Fox news. I got to work on Hannity and Combs right out of school, ch oh touring the country with, with Hannity and Combs asking both sides of the aisle questions about politics. I, I, that, I used to love that show. I, I, I was, oh, was so sad best. when it went away. Cause I love so the sad. whole, you know, I'm, I'm a debater at heart because my, yeah. my undergrads in philosophy and, and I just love the sharing of ideas, whether you agree with it or not. Something I want to point out, uh, uh, listeners, to what Vinny just said, too, there, uh, just to put a finer edge on it, is mm -hmm. that Vinny did what he did without uh, thinking he was in charge of those people's response. He did not know mm -hmm. that he would get responses from hundreds of people. He just sowed the seed. And in our lives, I think that's what we are. Uh, stop putting yourself in charge of other people's behavior, other people's responsivity. Just do your thing. You know, decide what there's meaning in doing and just do that. And that's your win. How do you know you've been successful? When you have woken up in the morning and gotten about your business as a human and focused on what you have control over. And one thing you do not have control over over are others people's, other people's responsivity to you. One of the, the worst things we see people do to themselves, uh, our patients, is they, they, for some reason, put themselves in charge of other people's response. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to tell you this, and oh my goodness, you've got to respond this way. You've got to be accepting of it. Uh, we put too much value in other people's being accepting of us instead of finding value in our place in the universe and doing things which bring meaning to life, you know. And I think that's what you did. You just, man, you just jumped out there at age 19 and did it. Gosh, what was I doing when I was 19? I think I was still trying to stay in college. But, yeah, uh, I was I was figuring my plan out. <laughs> I, left, I, actually, I wanted I to get early. back to, back to our, <laughs> our, our little open loop that we started off earlier, yeah. a little teaser about what is it that makes celebrities different and then 
what is it that makes them the same as all the rest of us? Yeah. Uh, I mean, what makes them different is, to be honest, probably just the level of visibility. Maybe that's the only thing. What makes us similar is how we use that visibility. We use visibility to get to discoverability. Being visible doesn't make you discovered. It doesn't get discovered until you actually share the visibility. Like if a tree falls and, you know, that whole sort of conversation around there. And what I'm getting at is this. Innately and accidentally, we're kind of really bad at getting discovered because we're not making easy, shareable ways that people can express who we are. Some of that might be content. Some of that might be this podcast episode. Some of it might be merch. There's a reason why I believe that people should have there because I, I can imagine a cooler way to meet two people who listen to this podcast and being at some music concert or some sh- uh, uh, festival or uh, an event where we're at school together and across the audience, I see my favorite podcast hat that I'm rocking as well. <laughs> and there's this moment of community and, and we're building audiences where everyone's building an audience, whether you like it or not, the people who follow you, that's your audience. When, Two people come together or two audiences come together. That's where community happens. Mm. Celebrities are great at building community because they collaborate. There's a reason why artists have an opening act and an end act. There's a reason why Beyonce went to Coachella, right? To hear she mm. is the top artist. What is she, how much more can you possibly – how higher – it's not about high. It's about width mm-hmm. and saturation and depth of relationship. What she did by going to Coachella – was brought the Beyonce fans and and brought them along with all the other artist fans that were there and the actual artists themselves. And the community will, the community voice will always, and it could be sometimes one person in the community, but the community voice will always cut through the clutter. Everything is great and there's, you're not stepping outside. There's no expansion of self. There's no expansion of goals. There's no succession of goals that it becomes hard to continue to subscribe and share. And this idea of of increased visibility to help you get more discovered, I wanna say it this way. Um, I think we get tired of seeing people when we can't share them. How about that? Now tell me what you mean by that. We get tired of seeing people when we can't share them. That's interesting. When we see our favorite actors and actresses, oh, did you see so-and-so on the news? That, That was great. Did you see them on SNL? It was hysterical. Two, two weeks later, the song's on the radio. Every single five minutes, everyone's hearing it. I can't share it with anybody. Uh, I'm not finding any value in it because I want to share this information. I want to share this experience, but everyone who's already has an experience with this content or this person. Um, everyone's over. I, I feel that I am no longer uh, the ego. This is like this is this is some this this is what I want to talk to you specifically about. Again, it gets to the <laughs> ego. Right where the ego feeds discoverability, I know this for a fact. When I'm pitching talent to a network, I go, I say this: here's a t- here's who I think it should be. Here are a couple of other options, and if we don't go with the person I think it's going to be, I guarantee you, a different network is going to grab that person up. So either we get to launch this talent, or someone else is going to. But we only get to launch talent once. And in my 10 years at MTV, Jessica Simpson, Mandy Moore, I mean, I can go on and on and on and on and on (laughs) about the new talent, Nick Cannon. I can go on and on and on about the talent that that we launched. There's something magical for me about being, you know, in the the beginning. But that ego, that ego is hungry cat. It's getting stroked and beautified and, you know, coddled. And that's that's what we get out of sharing things. By the way, my mom called me Vinny. Michael Bublé, he's the biggest artist. I just went to Kmart. <laughs> Everyone's getting stocking stuffers. Everyone's getting the album. I went to church. I told all the ladies. He gave her an opportunity. We got to watch the show. What a killer way for an artist to make an impact. By the way, he's still closely associated with holiday programming. So this is – I want to point this out because around this I time love of Michael year, I love Michael Bublé. You're right. Also, holiday music is um, uh, in terms of uh, the expense of creating – Music, um, holiday music is often public domain, so there's no cost for the actual oh. music. There's just the recording. So a lot of uh-huh. artists record holiday albums because it's the cheapest way to record IP and make the most amount of money because you know the album doesn't change. And then they usually will throw one or two completely original 
songs in there. So uh-huh. as you go and listen to your holiday albums, I want you to be mindful of that little trick that I'm sharing with you because you'll see it in every single album that you're listening to. Hey, hey guys, um, listen to us today. Uh, uh, I have a, a, a trivia question. Uh, put it in the comments and and email us. I'd, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Who would you say would be the king, the original king, uh, way, way, way back of holiday music? Uh, who, who do you think it'd be, Vinny? Me? I mean, uh, I'm going with Bing. Uh, oh, uh, Bing yes. Crosby was Bing in my household. In my gra- I'm thinking of my grandma Fran downstairs. And yeah, Bing Crosby was. Uh, Bing Crosby. You know, you can yeah. thank Bing Crosby. I think Bing Crosby was the first singer to be. What was what was he? He was the first at something at being broadcast. Uh, maybe the first record or something. But Bing maybe was the a first tra- like live TV. Well, he was a radio. trailblazer. He really was okay. a trailblazer. I mean, I just because I and, and then I moved to Hoboken, literally down the street from where Frank Sinatra grew up. Oh wow, how interesting! My other favorite singer, Frank Sinatra. That's it. I love his stuff. Um, well, what, what are some, uh, uh, things that you find celebrities struggle with, with their brand at, at getting straight and keeping straight in their career? Yeah. So let's go back to this visibility word. There's a reason why every single year, the Grammys, the Tonys, the Oscars happen. Uh, actors don't have one shot in life to win these awards. They have an annual shot at getting it uh, by winning an award. It uh, increases the market value. It demonstrates to financers that an audience is connected to that person, which allows films to fund more money for larger budgets. So there's a big reason why a business structure, why celebrities are winning some of these top awards, because it has, it has a direct correlation to how they're financing and how they're creating their projects. Also, it is the way we level up. They don't have to, you know, um, uh, uh, it's not in winning the award that gets them to the next level. It's in the thank you speech. It's uh, in the way that they leverage, you know, that award afterwards. Winning the award is a, a moment to allow us to, by the way, to say thank you to the 50, 60, 100 people who got us there, right? Mm-hmm. Most, most awards, except for this one famous thank you speech from Snoop Dogg, by the way. And if you haven't heard it, it's worth the listen. He says, you know, I want to, th- you know, he gets up to do a thank you speech. He goes, you know who I want to thank? I want to thank me. I want to thank me for showing up. I want to thank me for not stopping. I want to thank me for never giving up. I want to thank me for not. And I, I, I sometimes I'm so, maybe it's a coping mechanism and I'm, there's people first for me, but I'm so generous and I'm so happy to be on a stage with people. And, and I'm going to say this, I'm six foot three. I'm happy to stand in the back. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and let the light shine yeah. on the road. My whole life, it's been Vinny, even in school, Vinny, close the lights, <laughs> shut the door. <laughs> you know, like I'm the tall guy at the end of the line, you know, in, in height order. So uh, there's this piece to me. Where, now, don't get me wrong. I love a moment, uh-huh. a, a brief moment of spotlight, um, where, but it's full of levity. There's Well, like, uh, Andy like, Warhol, everybody <laughs> has, what, their 15 minutes of fame or something, yeah, you know? And, yeah, and I yeah. want to point out, Something important, very important about what you're saying is uh, from, from my side of the equation, I find that it's it's a that there can be a very fine line between narcissism. And by the way, uh, friends, please, 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 uh, unless you have a license, don't go around diagnosing your friends and family members mm. with narcissism or anything else. It's 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 unethical and it's just not helpful. And by the way, you clinicians that have a license, you shouldn't be diagnosing friends and family anyway. Uh, don't don't treat or diagnose friends and family. But but when I use narcissism, I mean it as a uh, just just kind of a thing that we can kind of fall into where we put mm-hmm. ourselves first all the time. And but I think it's 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 a very fine line between. Uh, maybe narcissism and self-worth where there's a lot of value in celebrating what you've accomplished. Mm. Uh, There's a lot of value at looking yourself in the mirror and saying, Hey, you know, you did it good for you Uh, because your brain is listening. Your brain is always, always listening to what you have to say and there are those moments, dads out there, you need to look in the mirror and celebrate your brand of being a dad or your brand of being a mom 
or if you did something valuable with a sibling, celebrating your brand of, of being a sibling. I mean, I think we all have many, many brands, and that is as, as a uh, spouse or significant other or mm-hmm. lover or friend or neighbor or employee. And don't wait for someone else to celebrate that. You give yourself that Academy Award. Give yourself that Emmy for really uh, uh, leaning into and embracing your brand as that human being. And you don't have to always be in the spotlight. But, goodness, I think even Mother Teresa, when she was walking the planet, found times where she celebrated her Mother Teresa-ness. And there's there's nothing wrong with that. You know, don't let it slide into narcissism. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with celebrating you. Don't wait around for someone else to do it. Uh, When you have a birthday, I mean, I know people that my dad was this way. He hated birthdays because he was so embarrassed that people would be celebrating him. And Mm -hmm. I I finally said, look, get over it. You know, let us celebrate you. You're helping us by letting us celebrate you. Father's Day, Mother's Day. Uh, my son used to joke. He, he said, "He said uh, one of his, his friends were talking that there's a Father's Day, a Mother's Day. There's a day for everything." And he said, "But I think it's better being a son because we have our day every week. It's called <laughs> Sunday." <laughs> I said, "Well, that's great, but you're not getting a gift every weekend." Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> or there's terms. There's terms here. I, you know, as you're saying that, I, I'm reminded, and I have to. One of the ways that I'm called to submit sometimes even for myself um, is to remind myself that mother Teresa won an award. She won an award for the Nobel peace prize. And with that peace prize comes tremendous ability to make impact. It's not the journey to that award that makes that award impactful. It's what happens afterwards. It's how we're able to leverage it. It's, it's the visibility that it gave us to mother Teresa back in 1979 and our ability to share this moment with our friends and family and whoever it is around us that that year, Matt. And then actually, I think the, a year after India gave her an amazing, uh, the government there gave her an amazing, um, uh, an award too. And I, I just remember going back at someone who I felt just from my upbringing, who's more selfless, at least from what I've been taught than the actions and the humanitarian behind what mother Teresa was able to do. And that, that I'm not saying I am mother Teresa, but why not? Yeah. Why not? I have the same goals. I want to make impact. I, I, I might not go about it the same way she did. I didn't become a psychologist because I, I was afraid of changing people people's lives. Do you know what I ended up doing? Getting into reality, create helping create the genre of reality TV, which does what? Change people's lives. Oh wow, it, it, yeah. It gives them control. You know, what I learned in TV was it wasn't in the act of recording new actions and the act of doing something new and the act of redemification. It's not in the act of any of those actions where reality changes. It's in the perception. And you nailed that perfectly at the top of this. If no one sees this episode, no one knows the change. No one would have seen Jessica Simpson in the current light that she's in. If we didn't stop the current obsessing in mass media about women's bodies and the way women specifically should or shouldn't do things, if MTV didn't give her the 30 minutes to show up as her true, authentic self. The well, Osborns, it, be really honest as well, it, too. And, and, and you know, uh, what, one thing that, that I like to point out and I, I think about when it comes to celebrity uh, that we do, we humans do best, is celebrity is really about uh, highlighting and celebrating mm-hmm. different aspects of humanity. Um, Carl Jung was big into, and where's my Carl Jung finger puppet? This is this is <laughs> Soren Kierkegaard, by the way, my favorite existentialist philosopher. But uh, Carl Jung talked about archetypes, and celebrities are a bit that way. They're an archetype mm-hmm. of a certain aspect of of humanity, and I think that's what we humans do the best is we. We celebrate our humanity. And what I'm yeah. encouraging listeners to do, and, and, and Vinny encourages celebrities to do that he works with, is, is, is be the authentic real you that only you can be. I mean, yes. Mr. Rogers had a great quote. I wish I, I could say it specifically, but uh, of, of all the ages and all the time throughout uh, the universe, you're the only you that will ever exist. There will never, ever be another you. And what a what a horrible thing to lose for there not to be a you. 
Everybody mm-hmm. listening to this, you're meant to be here. And the one thing that uh, that that jumps out to me about celebrities, uh, the great equalizer, is that every single one of them is human. Mm-hmm. Uh, every single one of them is human, and they all have ten basic emotions: happy, sad, mad, glad, disgusted, ashamed, stressed, depressed, anxious, angry. Uh, they all have struggles. They all have things that they. They have trouble dealing with. Uh, they're all human. They're just on camera. They're on camera yeah. a lot. And we call them celebrities. Here's a little bit of neuroscience behind that. Is our brains have a love affair with faces. And the more we see a face, the more brain cells are created to encode that face, literally engrave it on our brains. Mm. Uh, we, we could take any face of anybody watching or listening and uh, if we wanted to make you a celebrity uh, and we broadcast your face enough, people would be uh, not in love with you, but in love with that facial configuration, which has been encoded upon their brain in a particular area called the fusiform gyrus. And that's celebrity. Celebrity is all about the fusiform gyrus. I love it. Uh, and- this face has been imprinted and imprinted and imprinted. As soon as I say the rock, you guys picture mm-hmm. a big muscled up bald guy, <laughs> you know, now that's not Dwayne Johnson. That's just the image you've created in your brain of Dwayne Johnson. Mm-hmm. Uh, you may love him. If you met him, you may not like him so much. If you met him, as they say, never meet your heroes. <laughs> uh, and a lot of celebrities are that way, but uh, celebrity is really a, a person that is an archetype of a certain aspect of humanity, but you are too. Uh, yeah. Each and everybody listening, you're an archetype in your own space, and that's what you need to be. So lean fully into it. Um, oh, I love that. You know, you know what most people have that most celebrities don't. By the way, I, I'm hearing control control over the amount of visibility yeah. that we have. You know, the title of this episode is 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 discovering and living. You know, in your personal brand, celebrities don't get to change the SEO title at the end when they're about to post. Celebrities don't get to look at everything we're posting and make making sure that the words are right, the tags are right. There's there's no sort of uh, algorithm to being successful when you don't control the content. We, a lot of us on social media, podcasters, creators, control our content. And this idea of having a content strategy makes me laugh sometimes. And, and I laugh only because like you don't want a content strategy. You want a life strategy. You want to just figure out how content can weave into your life strategy. But the last thing you need is to be focused on content. What you could be focused on yourself and have a system where content is pulling from your actions. Like I love the words inspire, ignite, impact. I would love to be discovered if anyone searches me for those words. Inspiring content. I would love to come up in those words. But I know that I can't control the SEO. And I certainly... I'm not going to tell it something that I think I am if I'm not living it. So what I do is I use those words every single day. I use them in my questions because then I get them back in my answers and they become part of the alchemy and what I'm creating. And I don't have to worry about the SEO at the end. I don't have to worry about how am I going to be discovered when someone finally sees the work that I'm doing because I've been journaling the entire time. That's journaling, meaning I've been I've been processing and creating and moving forward the entire time and documenting it and understanding how how I can, by the way, do that. And some of it is technology. Some of it is is creating really healthy borders that you can operate within. And the best thing about borders is that when it's time to expand them, you know what growth feels like. When you go outside of the box, you know what that box feels like. But without setting boundaries, it's really hard to think outside the box. It's really hard to expand boundaries. Um, and those are just some little ways that I've seen people be really successful in, in creating personal brands that are sustainable. Beyonce, Mandy Moore, Ashton Kutcher, Jessica Simpson. These are people who are not just relevant in ed- in entertainment, but are relevant when it comes to the laws that we're living by and the stores that we're shopping at and the content we're consuming, the the cars we're driving, like the, the way we get to the moon. Like these are people who are impacting, you know, um, us because they saw the powerful tool they had and their voice and, and their likeness. Oh, I love this episode so much. I'm going to listen to this a lot. <laughs> and leveraged it. And they weren't afraid to say, Maybe the world's going to give me something bigger. Maybe, 
maybe I'm getting more than I asked for. Maybe I'm going to get 700 people responding back to me when I was hoping for 20. You know what I mean? What I didn't do was buy a bin for 20 headshots. I didn't even think about what was oh, coming. I'm glad I didn't because that's – by the way, I won an Emmy just last year. Oh, congratulations. Thank you very much. I bring this up because I say, like, you, you know, we say, if, we, if you want the, you, we said earlier, if you want the Emmy, if you want the Tony, give yourself the Emmy, give yourself the Emmy. I realized I didn't have an Emmy. I realized I wanted one. It needed to be uh, with the right people. It needed to be about a project that I would forever be proud to talk about because I know that I could probably jump on project headed towards success and um, not love the topic. Uh, this topic is called Red Flags. Uh, a sh- intervention is on A&E and that show focuses on discovering a problem and it ends <laughs> it ends happily ever after with the person going into rehab and I'm like that's not where the story ends and wh- what Red Flags does is it follows the journey of a person out of rehab for the first 80 days so what are the red flags that we as the people who are supporting them and I, I'm I'm sensitive of being an enabler. I have been in the past and I want to be really conscious to be strong for myself and for the people that I surround myself with. So what are the red flags that are relevant to me and to them? And what what are ways that I can better, you know, um, set us up for success? And, 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 and the, the best part was the people I got to win it with Kevin Harrington, uh, Jeff Hoffman, the original uh, CEO of Priceline, Brandon T. Adams, Samantha Rosine, like some killer people that I will forever love saying <laughs> that I got to share a moment with them and we created something that was really meaningful. And, and how I leverage that award is, look, I have a 25 year background in TV and I've done a lot of uh, I did a lot of sc- scripted content prior to unscripted content. So putting Beyonce in films and casting freedom writers with Hillary Swank. I, I got to do a lot of stuff scripted that was on the normal casting trajectory. But when I had the opportunity to stand out, when I had the opportunity to step in to a position that no one had ever done into a world that I almost accidentally helped create, I thought to myself, well, no one can compare them to me. And sometimes being compared to others could literally limit me, could stop me in my tracks from moving forward. And this is that was the secret, I think, to my success. Is like, I don't think anyone's going to reach out to people and ask them for that. I don't think anyone's going to do that. And I started doing things that I really didn't think most people were doing. And I did them well. And I did them over and over again. And it's a system. I do a lot. But I do the same thing over and over again. And I have a very strict I have, I have a, a, an annual strategy where every single month I focus on a single word so that I don't have to try to get all 12 of my words in this piece of content that I believe ah. in tomorrow and I'm preparing for tomorrow by living in today. You know, I'm mindful of tomorrow. This conversation is predicated on getting me to tomorrow, mm-hmm. not getting me through today. And that's, yeah. that's really helped me serve other people and be a steward to their success. I love that. I love that. And, and, and guys and gals, listen, uh, uh, I, I want to point out the things that Vinny said earlier that you just heard him, as we say here, put some shoe leather on. He was the author of his own story in that moment. And he, uh, what was the, uh, the other word, the source of this information based on him just being him. I mean, he didn't go out and try to replicate or copy. He just found meaning and purpose in what he was doing. And I'm not saying that you're going to get an Emmy out of it the way that he did, but that's how he got to that point. He didn't get there by being, you know, someone else out there in, in, in the bright lights or Hollywood or somewhere. He simply became the author of his own story and the source of that valued information. And we could talk about this all day. Vinny, this has been just such a heck of a lot of fun. And I have one more thing left to go. And by the way, you guys know that we pull this on uh, our guests uh, because we'd like for it to be impromptu. Uh, But I'm actually sitting on a therapy couch, but I'm going to go under the deep, dark recesses, as we say, of the therapy couch. And I'm going to pull out a piece of paper here and I don't know what it's going to say, uh, but I'm going to read this to, uh, to Vinny and ask him uh, the, uh, the question I ask viewers. It's a different question every time. Okay. Here's, here's we're going to go a little bit Freudian here. A little bit Freudian. Okay. Huh. Well, Vinny, 
if you could speak to any animal, any animal on the planet, uh, what would you ask? Um, uh, I'm, I'm just going to go with what's kind of coming to the, to my gut and, yeah. um, you know, maybe I would ask that groundhog how he feels about everyone telling him what his job should be. <laughs> like that groundhog. Just because the whole it. world tells you you're supposed to be afraid of your shadow and you're <laughs> the one that... How does that make you feel, buddy? I come from Staten Island. There's a Staten Island. There is a Staten There's a little bit of a Staten Island pride in that one. But I always I always felt bad for that. What if that's not what... It, I think of the elf, you know, in the Christmas... What if what if he, that... What if that... Go, what if you groundhog's supposed to be like a dentist? And, he, <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> Stop telling him what he's supposed to do and stop reading. The poor guy getting – poor beaver can't even – beaver, I'm saying. Groundhog can't even be in itself. And uh, every action that it does is interpreted completely incorrectly or correctly by science. Yeah, dictated by one God. day of the whole year. Why you know, can't that groundhog decide who he's going to be? Yeah, right? Why can't that groundhog decide who he's going to be? Is that a weird <laughs> question? That's what I came up with. That's <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Hey, listeners, thank you for joining in. And we so much appreciate it having Vinny here today. Hope you find as much usefulness in the, in the message as I did. Go out there, create your own story. Be the author of your own story, uh, the valued source of information for others in your life. You are meant to be here. Your job is being a big Y-O-U and filling the shape that the universe has created in which for you to exist. Go out there and be you. Vinny, thanks so much, and we'll catch you guys next time. All right, bye-bye. Welcome to On the Couch and Off Our Rocker with Dr. Ima Freudnot, where we review our special guest's Therapy Bites Art Lab episode, Psychomolarchy Scale Assessment Results. That's PMS for short. Emmy Award winner Vinny Portestivo's PMS performance places him in the 99th percentile on the PMS's PLP, podcast like Portestivo scale. This indicates a tremendously titanic tendency toward top-notch tete-a-tete in Vinnie Vissen Emmy's vertically inclined voracious ventricles and an exuberant exchange of extraordinarily exceptional erudition. Overall, MTV's erstwhile executive Vinnie Potestivo's PMS psychosilly metric assessment results present a picture of an individual dreadfully dedicated to diligently directing towards distinctive difference making those poor souls predisposed with proclivities of podcasting predilections. However, due to these torrential, implicit, impactful, indulgent impulses, our subject suffers interminable, ineradicable interviewitis, an infection of affection for conversation and confabulation. This superlatively splendiferous soul likely has a parallel prognosis of perpetual potestivosis and podcasteritis in the foreseeable future until the unquenchable, unconscious inundations of his psyche have been psychomologically analyzed and exercised. It is my considered conclusion that Mr. Vinnie Potestivo be prescribed no less than a QD 350mg oral dose of Potestival ER and a QHS 1000mg intracranial dose of Podcasteril LP to curtail any production-related preteritionitis. Dr. Ima Freudnot, Chief Shrinkstigator, Therapy Bites Art Lab. Grab some of this episode's guest merchandise, specially designed to help keep this episode's message top of mind in your life. Don't forget friends and family members who could use an Art Lab mental boost, too. Just go to therapybites.myshopify.com. Hey, T-Ballers. Thanks so much for being with us today. If we brought value to your day, show us some love by leaving your positive feedback and inviting some friends to listen in and join the T-Ball team. Next time on Therapy Bites Art Lab. Hey, T-Ballers, do you look at your schedule and see a forest of cluttered appointments littering the pages of your life? Have you ever been buried in a closet avalanche? Have you ever lost your children in a garage that's more like a garbage jungle? Our guest today is the queen of clean, your clutter's worst nightmare, and she's here to clean you up. 
Warning. Beware proceeding if you're allergic to challenging thoughts. Because our guest today is bringing plenty of those, along with their dustbuster, into the art lab today. Today's guest, Dave of Decluttering, loves helping people shift their beliefs, decluttering anything that's no longer serving them, and take action to create the business and life they desire. Sharing examples and stories from her own journey, you'll finish today's episode understanding that if Gail can declutter, you can do. T-ballers, grab your day planners, both electronic and old school, and get ready to crank up those mental dust busters as we welcome into the art lab our own get-up-and-get-organized genie, Gail Wood, on an episode we call Life Decluttered, The Psychology of Schedule Hacking. Up next on Therapy Bites Art Lab. Government legal gobbledygook. Therapy Bites is not intended as a diagnostic or as an alternative to professional clinical treatment. Resources and advice are for information and entertainment purposes only. Brought to you by... Someone saying things you don't like? Tape that nagging loudmouth shut. Government-approved speech tape. Gas tape. Now available at your local hardware store. Therapy Bites Art Lab is not, not, not an approved, not, endorsed, not. authorized, blood kissing affiliate of the United States Special Offense Assessment Police. Soap for short. Warning. Consumption of Therapy Bites Art Lab content by Kool Aid drinking, stinking thinking, social media, pseudo psychological pushing, wacky woke anti free speech mumbo jumbo advocates may cause spontaneous internal skull combustion, stomach discomfort, and or laxative effects. Allergy warning. Therapy Bites is manufactured in a facility that challenges nutty distortions, processes nuggets of accurate, realistic thinking, and life-affirming reliefs. This is the audio version of the legal fine print. Why are you still listening to this when you can catch the next great episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab with a good friend or family member? Really? Are you still there? (laughs) This is getting silly. Move on to the next psychologically thrilling episode of the best advice on the net. No copay required. Me eat copay. Yeah, with Dr. Heath and the T-Ball team. Go ahead. Don't be podgorophobic. Scoot, scoot, scoot. On to the next episode. <laughs>